God in the Bible? So we're in this study <clears throat> called That's Not in the Bible, and I want to launch into this morning with a question. Raise your hand if you know who Nicholas Sparks is. Okay, there's a few of you. There you go. Well, Nicholas Sparks, for those that don't know, is a man who writes books that turn into movies that sell Kleenex. I've never read one of his books. I've never been to one of his movies. It's just not on my bucket list. But I can't really poke fun because before Nicholas Sparks, there was Eric Siegel. And Eric Siegel wrote the book from back in the day that became the movie. It was titled Love Story. How many of you can remember that movie or that book? Okay, a few, few more. Well, it starred two young, attractive actors named Ally McGraw and Ryan O'Neill, and it was your typical plot line. They're in college, they meet early in the movie. He's a young, brash jock. She's an intellectual, sarcastic co-ed, and they instantly hate each other, which means that they're going to fall in love. And the first hour of the movie is a comedy where they, they actually, we watch them fall in love. And then there's five minutes of shared happiness, followed by over 40 minutes of tragedy as we watch her contract leukemia and eventually die. And in one of the last scenes, as she's laying in her hospital bed and she is with him and he's expressing regret to her and the music cues up and, and she bats her eyes and then she says it. She says the line that was the it line from that entire era. Love means you never have to say you're sorry. And the women sighed and they cried and it became a poster and it became a hit song of that day. Love means you never have to say you're sorry, which is the dumbest thing that anybody has ever said. Love means you have to say you're sorry all the time. And any of you that are newer husbands or if you're listening and you're going to get married, let me tell you, you better say you're sorry for the things that you did. Um, you better say you're sorry for the things that you did and you didn't know they were even wrong. And you better say you're sorry for not knowing that you're sorry. And you better throw in a couple of just random I'm sorry's just to cover a multitude of sins. I'm sorry. <laughs> we are always dispensing this, this common wisdom that sounds intelligent, but it's really not very helpful at all. I heard about a woman who called into a, a radio talk show and they were offering on the show home advice and she was very frantic. And she said to the, to the radio talk show host, I, I've got a skunk in my basement, what do I do? Well, he stayed very calm and he said, well, here's what you do. Open the door to your backyard and put a, a trail of, of breadcrumbs or you could use cat food and, and it'll eventually work itself out. Well, an hour later, she calls back to the show. Now she's not just frantic, she's furious. And she says, now I have two skunks in my basement. <laughs> and I bet that you have either given or been on the receiving end of advice that was intended to be helpful but wasn't very useful at all. And we do that a lot thinking that we are using the Bible, but as we have seen in this series, that phrase, follow your heart, that's not in the Bible. And next week when, uh, when we come back where that phrase that every time there's a tragedy, every time a, 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 a sports hero tears up his knee and has to leave his, his sport, we say, well, everything happens for a reason. Is that in the Bible? And, and no doubt when, when you or a friend is, has gone through a very difficult trying season, someone has said to you, God will never give you more than you can handle. 
Now, is that useful? Because honestly, isn't that in some measure more of a taunt than a word of comfort? Because, because aren't you basically implying, hey, just cowboy up. I mean, you're, you're being a wimp. It's not that bad. Just power through this. Get, get over it. So I'm not sure it's very useful, but more than that, is it truthful? Is God a cosmic cheerleader that, that just piles on a whole bunch of pain and, and junk and, and burden on your life and then he stands back shouting, you can do it, you can do it, try harder. See, I want to speak to you about the promise of not more. You're thinking now, preacher, I know that there is a verse in the Bible about this because I heard my grandmother say something about God never giving us more than we can bear. Well, let's take a moment. Let's look at that verse closely, shall we? From 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, the Apostle Paul tells the church in Corinth, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. When you are tempted, He will provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Now what is that verse saying? And just as important, what is that verse not saying? Well, it is saying that not sinning is always an option. Because here's the deal. When you get baptized, and I'm just going to stop for a second on this because, uh, because some of you have not been baptized. Let me just say a quick word about that. Jesus got baptized. Jesus told his disciples to go into all the world and baptize people who want to be disciples. So if Jesus did it, and if Jesus said, go do it, that is a really good reason to get baptized. And if you have not done that, you need to do that soon. But you need to understand that when you get baptized, it does not drown the devil. In fact, in some ways, you've got a bigger target on your back. And so he doesn't say if, but he says, when you are tempted, because you cannot avoid temptation, but this verse says you can always escape it. In other words, what Paul is saying is that no Christian ever gets to say, yes, I sinned, but I had no choice. That's not true if the Bible is true. Because the Bible says that God will never put you in a situation where the only thing that you can do is disobey God. He will not let you, it says, which implies to me that if it wasn't up to God, it could happen. You could be under more than you can bear by far because you have an enemy and he is a liar and he is a thief and he is a murderer and he would come at you with everything if God would let him. Remember, God said to the devil about Job, you can go this far, but you cannot go that far. Bob Russell used to tell a story about a cat in New York City that had a kitten in her mouth. She was trying to cross a very busy street, but she couldn't because of the traffic. And a police officer who was kind saw this whole dilemma of this cat with the kitten in her mouth. And, and he walks out to the middle of the street and he puts up his arm. And all of the traffic stopped, and the cat ran across the street with the kitten in its mouth into an alley out of sight. And the cat was completely unaware that with raised hand and the full authority of the New York City Police Department, they were protecting her. Let me tell you something. You have no idea how many times God has held up his hand and he has protected you from an attack that would have, would have taken you out except for his care. God will not let you take a temptation test that is impossible for you to pass. There is always a way out from sinning, but there is no way out from suffering apart from resurrection. And so the apostle 
The same one who said that we never have to disobey wrote to the same church in his second letter, and he said we may have to despair. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. Paul writes these words. We, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired of even life. Paul is saying that not sinning is always an option, but not suffering is never an option. Disobedience is not to be excused, but discouragement ought to be expected. Look at, look at that exact same verse from the New Living Translation. We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure, and we thought we would never live through it. Now, does this sound like a man who might be going through more than he can handle? And no time... Do we have to be overcome by sin? But there will be times when we will be overwhelmed by life. And somebody in this room is saying, oh yeah, in your heart. God doesn't have to order that. It's simply the consequence of living in a fallen and broken world in need of redemption. But what God does not order, He does allow he did allow Satan to attack Job. He did let Job go, more, go through more than he could endure. You read through the Psalms and you could, you could subtitle, I think, half of, of David's Psalms that he wrote. I can't take it anymore. God will let you go through that season in the belly of a fish like Jonah where you don't know what to do except to cry out to God. A more than you can handle season is not an elective course that just some people are going to have to take. It is a required course that every single one of us will be enrolled in. Suffering is a given, but suffering can be a, a gift, especially when it is too much. Look at the very next verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. Paul writes, In fact, we expected to die. But as a result, we stop relying on ourselves and learn to rely on God who raises the dead. So why does God give us the, the gift of too much? Why does God let us go through a, a season that is more than we can handle in our own strength. Here is one of the reasons, so that we will rely on Him. We go through too much, so we will learn to rely on God. Now you need to know something about me, and you need to know this about me, because what is true of me is also true of you. My sinful flesh values self-reliance. I want to fix it. I want to cowboy up. I, I want to believe I can, just, I can just hunker down and I can power through it. You need to know something about me because the same is true of you. I am created to need God. And I am never in more desperate shape than when I forget how desperate I should be for God. And that is why too much can sometimes be just right. Because we can't live on top of a mountain. Now, I'm thankful for mountaintop experiences, but, but some of you make the mistake of thinking that the only place that you can know about God is up on top of the mountain. So you rush to every spiritual experience that you can, looking for your next God high. And here's the reality. Life will not let you stay up on top of the mountain. Now, Paul got to go to the top of the mountain. He says, I, I was caught up in, in the spirit to the third heaven, and I, I saw things, I heard things, I can't even talk about it. But Paul couldn't stay there, so he writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, so to keep me from becoming proud, 
I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord, take it away. And each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. God used an attack of Satan on his servant to protect his servant from succumbing to the sin that destroyed Satan. Satan fell because of pride, and God used Satan to keep Paul from falling because of pride. That is called sovereignty. And Paul experienced in the depth of the valley a depth of grace he had never known. So let me ask you, do you mean what you sing? Because all the time I hear you singing about how much you want to know God and you want to be closer to God because you will never know how all sufficient the grace of God is until every prop and every crutch that you lean on is taken away and all you have is God. You will never know how strong the grace of God is apart from going through a season of tremendous weakness. Let me get real personal with you. I went through a season like that. Your job is stressful, my job is stressful. All of our jobs have seasons that, that are especially stressful and I was in a particular season where things were very stressful and this was during a time when my grandmother became very ill. She got sick. She was dying. I flew down to Florida to be there with her at the same time. My oldest son was going through struggles and our family was in a very hard place. We were hurting. And seasons of weakness don't just last 24 hours. <laughs> this went on for a long time. And almost every single night I was restless and I was in pain and I would wake up and I would pray to God to give me the wisdom to fix this. And one night in prayer I heard the Lord say to me so clear, let go. And I'll be honest, my first immediate response was, I don't want to. Lord was firm with me and he said, Mike, you can't fix this. And I thought, well, Lord, if, if I let go, then I'm just going to have to totally trust you. And I did. And the next day, everything wasn't fixed. In fact, it's still being fixed. But I was changed because I experienced and walked in a level of the sustaining grace of God that in my pride I had resisted knowing pretty much my whole life. What does the Bible say? He gives grace to the humble. So anything that is humbling me is helping me. And when you pray, God, I cannot handle this anymore. It is a sign of weakness, and that is a good thing. Because listen to me, God doesn't give grace instead of weakness. God gives grace in the midst of weakness. And his grace to his people usually comes through his people. Look back in chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians. Paul writes, we have placed our confidence in him. And he will continue to rescue us. And you are helping us by praying for us. So why does God give us the gift of too much? So that we will rely on him also so that we will comfort each other. You have heard the phrase that hurt people hurt people. That's true. But do you know what else is also true? 
Hurt people can help and heal people. Following Jesus is a, a team sport. You, you've heard me say that many times. And, and if Satan knows that he cannot get you to be disobedient, he will settle for getting you to be disconnected because Satan knows that you cannot do the Jesus life by yourself. So God often gives grace in more than I can handle seasons by other people who understand too much. Look at Paul says again, 2 Corinthians 1, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. Maybe instead of asking God to remove your thorn, you should ask Him to redeem it. Maybe that thorn can be converted into someone else's blessing. You know that when an oyster gets a crack in its shell, it can let a grain of sand get inside that irritates the soft tissue of the creature. So our Creator has designed that oyster with the ability to secrete this this fluid that coats the grain of sand and soon it hardens and it becomes a pearl. The pain becomes a treasure to give to someone else because a pearl is a healed wound. Your scars become your story. Bethany Hamilton is a, a surfer. She lost her arm in a shark attack when she was just 14 years old. They made a movie about her a few years back. She is a very strong believer, and God has used her weakness. She says, I have had the chance to embrace more people with one arm than I ever could have with two. What you have come through has prepared you for what God may be calling you to. You might not realize this, but this room is filled with weakness. Church people don't have it all together. What I want to do right now is I just want to list some seasons of more than you can handle trials. And if it is a season that you are going through right now or someone that you know is going through, I just want you to stand up. So here we are. If in the last three years you have lost a family member or a very close friend, would you mind just standing up where you're at? If you or someone in your family has gone through the terrible pain of divorce, would you mind standing up? If you or someone that you love is struggling with cancer, would you mind standing up? If you or someone that you love is struggling with addiction, would you please stand? If you or someone in your family is going through or has gone through great financial stress, would you stand up? If you or someone in your family deals with mental illness, would you stand up? If you or someone in your family is dealing with Alzheimer's, would you stand up? If you have a, a child or a grandchild that's in a very bad place, would you stand? I could continue, but there's no point. You may be seated. Here is what I know. There is weakness all over this room. There are scars. But we know that one day, all suffering will be removed. The question is today, can my suffering be redeemed? Because when life is more than we can handle, we learn that God's grace is more than we can imagine. That's what the Bible says. And somebody needs to know that because you have learned that.
When you came to Christ, someone said, you need to offer Christ everything. And that is right. And typically we offer Jesus our strength, my gifts, my talents, my treasure, my abilities. And we should do that. But we should offer Jesus everything. Have you ever offered Jesus your weakness? What if, what if this became your prayer? Lord, may my weakness become your witness. I, I want to give you a moment to pray that prayer. So I want you to just go ahead where you're at, bow your head. You already know exactly what your weakness is. So don't, today, don't ask God to take it away. That's not a bad prayer, but that's a different prayer for a different time. Today, we're going to pray this. Lord, would you redeem my weakness for your glory? Lord, would you allow my weakness to be a part of the witness of your grace? 